Hi, everyone. Welcome back to the AOC PM&R podcast series. My name is Tony Song, a current fourth year student and one of the co-chairs of the Digital Multimedia Committee. Today, I'm honored uh, to introduce you all to our guest today, Dr. Thomas Jan. How are you doing, Dr. Jan? Doing fine, thank you. Thanks for having me. Thank you so much for your time. Uh, so Dr. Jan, a brief introduction, is a triple board certified physician, primarily, in, uh, primarily certified in PM&R. Uh, with subspecialty board certification in pain as well as addiction medicine. Uh, so we got quite a doozy list. Dr. Jan was also the former member of the American Osteopathic Board of PM&R. Uh, Dr. Jan is the founding, uh, founding and current chair of the American Osteopathic Pain Medicine Conjoint Examination Committee. And uh, Dr. Jan is also the uh, medical director of the Long Island Council on Alcohol and Drug Dependence. And he started uh, the first Narcan training in 2009 um, training the general public. Dr. Jen is also the director of medical education at Mercy Hospital and Rockville Center. And finally, Dr. Jen is also the program director of the PMNR residency at Mercy Hospital and Rockville Center. Did I get everything? An all around great guy. Yeah. An all around a great guy with a, with a nice set of hair as well. There you go. <clears throat> Old man with long hair. <laughs> so, so to start off, we like to ask all of our guests, um, how did you first discover the field of PMNR uh, when you were a medical student? Actually, uh, I was near the end of my fourth year of uh, medical school. I had an elective to fill out, and a buddy of mine told me uh, it's a nice rotation. Everybody's nice over at NUMC, and so I decided to rotate through there. And it always stuck in the back of my head. I, geez, I kind of like this because I liked orthopedics. I liked uh, understanding the mechanics. I mean, I grew up in job sites when I was uh, when I was a kid, you know, framing houses. So I, I like structure. I like understanding, you know, doing a force vector analysis when I look at a human body. And uh, physiatry encompassed a lot of fields. And, I, and it really, it, it piqued my interest. And fortunately for me, I was uh, afforded the opportunity to train at Mount Sinai in Manhattan. I was actually accepted there. And that was where I did my residency and uh, fell in love with the field. I, a lot of people don't realize physical medicine rehabilitation has one word that defines it, and that's function. It was started by Howard Rusk after World War II, if you've heard of the Rusk Institute, a part of NYU. Uh, Howard Rusk saw the need for a field of medicine to address all the veterans and also civilians who were injured during the war uh, coming back from World War II. And that's why we have these this multitude of subspecialties within physical medicine and rehabilitation because anything that affects your ability to function is part of our field. From pain to neuromuscular skeletal, uh, musculoskeletal or neuromuscular dysfunction, cardiac, pulmonary, pain, uh, you name it, spinal cord injury, traumatic brain injury, the whole, the whole gamut. Wow. Um, thank you. Uh, thank you for sharing all that. I did not know any of that really. Uh, and so uh, that was, Definitely very interesting to hear. And I we sort of delved into it. My next question was going to be, what specifically drew you uh, to the field of pain and addiction specifically? Uh, so I like general physiatry. I like pain as well. Uh, let me rephrase that. Um, I like treating pain and I saw there's a need for it. And back in the the double noughts, uh, I'm sorry, the, uh, the 90s and then the double noughts, you know, the 2000s. <laughs> Uh, there was a lot of pain medicine, a lot of prescribing of pain medication. Uh, and of course, that's a part of the treatment of pain. You know, in the 80s into the 90s, we had that thing with pain is the fifth vital sign. We were aggressively promoting the treatment of pain. And so I felt the need and I stepped in. Um, got into addiction eventually because I saw by 2004, I had a couple of patients who were showing aberrant behavior. Um, many people don't realize this, the state database that checks prescriptions in New York State has been around since 2004, and I've been using it since 2004, since it first came out, but back then it only had the last 30 days and there was no requirement that the pharmacies actually put patients in there and there was no requirement that doctors check it. I'm proud to say that's changed. I helped participate in the advocacy for the iStop legislation that, that made it mandatory it actually looks back a year. So I started <clears throat> noticing aberrant behavior and I had known a little bit about addiction and I started learning more and I started treating. I got certified with uh, buprenorphine, Suboxone, 
which is part of the, it's called the CSAT waiver. Um, and I started treating uh, opioid uh, substance use disorder with Suboxone with people in pain. And I noticed that Suboxone actually was a pretty good analgesic. And uh, so I don't want to go off on a tangent here, but people have to realize that an alcoholic and an addict, alcohol and drugs, are not their problem. The problem is, is thinking. Mm. The alcohol and drugs are a symptom of their problem. That's why when you look at AA or NA or any of the A's, any 12-step program, only the first step mentions the addictive substance or the addictive behavior. Mm. Uh, the other 11 steps talk about clearing up the mess that goes on between the two ears. That makes sense. And so treating pain in the recovering population became my little, how shall I put it, um, my little niche. Uh, and that's when I got involved with Long Island Council on Alcoholism and Drug Dependence. We started the first Narcan training for the public in 2009. I was the, the medical director of the town of Babylon Drug and Alcohol. I'm currently medical director of the Camp Peter Center for Recovery. Um, do a lot of volunteer uh, work in the field. Absolutely. Thank you so much for sharing that journey of yours, uh, Dr. Of Definitely appreciate it. I will tell you, I've also... Uh, served eight years on uh, the county executive at Mangano on his task force for her prescription drug abuse. And I'm proud to say that uh, seven doctors and three nurse practitioners in part are in jail because of me. And these were, this is what we're gonna be getting into talking about in a little while. Mm -hmm. You'll remember when I mentioned that to you, it, it was a little scary for you, but then you realized when I told you some stories, you saw how high the bar is to actually get in trouble. Every one of these people I'm talking about were overt drug dealers that had actually killed people. There were deaths directly related, proved in a court of law to all ten of them. And I remember you showing me they they had ample opportunity to to come clean to to do the right thing, but that's right. Um, and that per perfectly kind of segues into since our next question is as uh, what advice or what tips would you have um, for physicians to sort of stay out of trouble and something that as students we should ingrain into our uh, minds now before we start our residency training well you've heard the expression uh, ignorance of the law is no excuse right well how many of you have heard about the stark laws have, did they ever teach that in school that was uh part of our board examination uh, part was, of the board exam but did they teach it they did not they should have it has to do with self-referral there's a lot of things that go on stark review has uh, stark laws have to do with um if i have a lab and I want to use that lab for my patients, and it's within this office, the same tax ID number, I can do that. But I cannot own a lab down the street with a different tax ID number, have an interest in that, and then send my patients there for that, that work because it's considered a self-referral scheme. Um, the idea here is that there was a lot of abuse of the, the system. Uh, granted, we all want to make an honest buck, um, but it came down that... Um, some people got a little too egregious and a little too greedy. You know, let, we'll get back to basics. There are three ways for a doctor to get in trouble. There's the civil, there's the criminal, and then there's the, um, and of course, I just drew a blank, the, the term I use for the um, regulatory. So regulatory, civil, and criminal. <laughs> Regulatory refer, refers to the uh, Office of Professional Medical Conduct. That's in New York State. They, it's, in other states, may have a different name for it. But basically, this is an investigatory board, uh, unit that can have a hearing about whether or not you keep your license. Basically, they could take money from you. They could take your license from you. They can't take your freedom. Now, the other ways to get in trouble are, would be, the other way to get in trouble would be the civil. Now, that would be malpractice, whether it be negligence, uh, whatever, most of it leads back to negligence. Um, when, you get, when somebody gets sued, again, you don't lose your freedom, but they could take your money. Then there's the criminal, and the bar is very, very high. The bar is, high to be, is set very high for a malpractice claim. You have to file within, I think it's two years or three years in New York State, and you have to show a, a verifiable loss, um, damages, <clears throat> excuse me. So the bar is high for a malpractice case. 
the bar is very high for a criminal hate case, even higher. Um, you can be an overprescriber and not get in trouble. You may be kicked out of an insurance plan. The hospital may, if, if you have uh, privileges there, they may decide, we, we don't want you part of it. But unless they could show, unless somebody gets hurt, of course, excuse me, or they could show that you're selling prescriptions, you're really not going to get in trouble until somebody gets hurt. And then they have to show that you're operating outside the normal standards acceptable for you for your region and for your specialty. Um, I don't mean to go off on a tangent here, so really back in if you uh, want to get a little more specific on some of these. Um, so if you're trying to do the right thing, it always helps to ask uh, an attorney who is uh, who specializes in medical law, because many attorneys more than happy to give you advice and they don't have a clue as to what's going on with medicine. Um, it's always good to have it, but you ultimately, it comes down to, you are responsible for what you say. If you remember that case I showed you where that doctor was told by the, the, um, the board that he was applying to, to sit for their exam said, they told me I could answer no to the question. Was I ever in trouble with my license? And they said, well, that doesn't matter. You have an obligation to be truthful. I know of a doctor who applied for his workers' comp, his workers comp uh, number so he could treat work-related injuries. And this doc had a permanent revocation of his license because, amongst other problems, when he applied for his workers' comp number, they asked, did you ever or are, is your license under investigation or have you ever been... And he actually asked an attorney and the attorney told him, just answer no, there's no need to worry about it. The attorney, and I could show you the actual, like I did with the other case, I could show you the actual OPMC hearing. The attorney testified that he advised him to do so. Excuse me. In their finding of revocation, they said clearly, Yes, you received bad advice from your attorney to do so, but you still, as a physician, know that you are not allowed to lie on the application. Now, as an aside, you can turn around and sue the lawyer for, ma for legal malpractice, hmm. but being told by a lawyer to do the wrong thing doesn't absolve us of using our head. So here's the deal. If it sounds too good to be true, it's quite likely too good to be true. Um, if, it's a get if it sounds like a get-rich-quick scheme, eh, very well, maybe. Um, you have an obligation as a physician in New York state. I can only speak to every place you practice. You have to have a copy of registration Costs ten dollars extra to get a copy of the registration for that address. It must be posted in a place visible to patients. I remember doing a lecture at Nikon. Oh God, about 10, 15 years ago. And we were talking about, uh, copays, the waiving of copays. Now, can you waive a fee to a patient? Yes, you can have them sign a medical hardship and you can waive a copay for that reason, but you are not allowed to routinely waive copays. And one of the doctors who happened to be at the lecture said, well, what if I don't participate in their insurance and I'm not a network? I can charge whatever I want or not charge them. No, the second you send a bill, what's called a HICFA, which is a, um, it's a, a, a bill, that a medical billing form, when you send that to the insurance company, you have now agreed to abide by their out-of-network benefits. And in doing so, you're obligated to charge that co-insurance or that copay to the patient. If you routinely waive that, then what that tells the insurance company is that you must be, or the insurance company interprets it as, you must be overcharging what you're doing to make up for the amount that the patient is supposed to be responsible for. Mm -hmm. You see what I'm saying? It sounds it sounds like, well, I don't participate. Why can't I waive it? It's in this one doc came up and he was like, holy cow, are you kidding me? I, I, I he had a sign that said, I guess about 15 years ago, almost 20 years ago, said copays are waived. And I'm there giving the lecture with my the with the attorney. And we looked and we said, we suggest you take that down. And he goes, I'm calling right now. And he ran outside and got made a phone call. There are stupid little things that can get you in trouble. Now, could he have gone 20 years with no problem? Yes. 
But the second there's an issue, that is something you can get in trouble for. Hmm. You're always better off not leaving yourself open to that. Um, I'll give you an example of a doc I know. He, he's actually a chiropractor. When he was first in practice 30 years ago, private practice, he was treating a family, friend, neighbor kind of thing, neighbor whose parents for, and then uh, the guy gets in a car accident. So he's treating him. And this patient says to him, listen, you know, I'm going away for a couple of weeks. Go ahead and bill the insurance, bill the three visits a week. And he says, no, 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 I'm not going to bill it if you're not here. He goes, don't worry about it. I'm not going to say anything. Go ahead and do it. So the guy goes away. He never billed those visits. Thank God. Because a month or two later, the attorney wants a, um, um, a narrative, a long letter about his treatment. And in that narrative, he wanted the narrative for free. Normally, there's a fee for the narrative. But also, he wanted to tell this chiropractor what to say in the narrative. To say, and he goes, I can't do this. Number one, I, I, I don't waive my fees. Number two, I'm not going to lie. And, the, and this patient, this family friend said, well, you know, you built those visits, didn't you, when I wasn't here? So I think you should do what I'm telling you. He says, you know, that's interesting. I never build those visits. I suggest you leave my office. Yeah. Don't ever, ever, ever put yourself in that position of being beholden to somebody. Because whether you like it or not, it seems innocent, it's fraud. You're required as a physician. <clears throat> if somebody tells you it's a work-related injury, you're required to cheat under workers' comp, a workers' compensation insurance. Now, people say, well, what's the difference? Use my insurance. I pay for it. Yeah, you pay for your health insurance. The law requires, though, if it's a work-related injury, you be treated under workers' compensation, number one, to protect the workers' rights, but also the private insurance company isn't the one financially responsible for those injuries. There's another insurance company. So this would be like, uh, you don't let, you, you just put a, um, a solar panel on your roof and the bill collector comes for the uh, for your payment. You said, nah, you know what? Just take it out of his his bank account next door. Have your neighbor pay for that. That uh, No, the, the person responsible is the one has to pay it. Am I speaking, going off on a tangent here or is that making sense? No, it's, uh, it's making sense. And it's, it's definitely extremely solid advice that uh, I think everyone actually needs to hear. Um, but that I'm just thinking back on that story. Thankful, like, thankfully that guy, he didn't, he didn't bill those. It's called being honest. Either you're honest or not. I knew a guy who was a very good friend of mine, went to medical school with him and he wound up stealing from me. And I'll never forget when he said to me once, he's talking about his brother doing something who was a doctor as well. He says, well, you know, there's honesty and there's integrity, but th then there's business. And I looked and I said, no, there's honesty and there's integrity. Whether it's business, whether it's personal, there's honesty and integrity. Love now, honesty doesn't mean, you know, it's a suicide pact. I have to tell you everything in my life. I have to bear my soul. I could say, look, I'm not at liberty to say something. But as a physician, we receive something of a special status in society where we are trusted. We can affirm our own signature without a notary public for workers' compensation. When we say something, we tend to be believed a lot more than the average person, particularly lawyers. Um, <laughs> so we have an, 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 you know, tagging off of that, another way you can get in trouble. Copying and pasting notes in the EMR. My goodness, I was the administrative director for pain at, at, uh, at Mather Hospital in Port Jeff. Great hospital. Fantastic. I love that hospital. I love this hospital too. I met my wife here when I was a sub intern. But um, I was in charge of the overdose reversal agent committee. And so I used to review a lot of charts as part of quality assurance. And two patients, both weighed less than 100 pounds. Both had intrathecal pumps in their abdomen, which is about, an intrathecal pump is about the size of a hockey puck, that big around and about that thick. So it's this big around, about that big around and that thick metal sitting under the abdomen. Both of these people were under 100 pounds within a month of one another. Both went through an admission in the hospital from the emergency room, were there at least a week or two. And at discharge, the physical exam still stated Abdomen soft, non-tender, no masses palpated. So we really bring it up before quality. Every single note in that chart had the same abdominal exam all the way through. First off, 
from the perspective of malpractice, remember the civil way you can get in trouble? Well, that's fraud, that that is a lie. And the second you do that, you must be truthful on your notes. If you didn't do an examination, you sure as heck should not be putting it in that note. And it, by the way, that pump was so big, both of these patients, you could walk in on them and see the bump under the sheet where this, this pump was. It's a big piece of metal, a big hunk of metal. So from a civil perspective, you wouldn't have a leg to stand on a malpractice. If something happened and they sued, it's an interesting thing. You know, you can have 10 doctors get sued from the same hospital with all have the same insurance carrier. The insurance carrier will issue each one of you, not just a different attorney, but a different law firm and a different attorney from that, from a different law firm. No two law firms will be used for the same people that that insurance company represents. So when you sit down in front of 20 some odd attorneys, each one re representing a different doctor, not only is the plaintiff's attorney going after you, but all those other attorneys are trying to shift the blame to you and off of themselves. And this, I think I told you the story, Dr. Ahmed, our chief medical officer, the man's great. I, I, I hope he doesn't see this because I don't like to talk nice about people to their face. No, nah, he's excellent. He gave a talk to all of a sudden, he was talking about how um, somebody had reviewed a note of a doctor that basically said the patient was complaining of X, the physical exam was Z, Y, he feels the diagnosis is Z, and then his plan was listed as A, and it was maybe this much of a note. And they said, this is insufficient, it's got to have you know old labs, got to this and that. Dr. Ahmed looked at it, he says, this is perfect, this is what we were taught in medical school, it's just called a SOAP note, mm -hmm. subjective, objective, assessment plan it doesn't have to be a six page note it's got to let people know what the treatment has been okay off on a tangent again reel me back in tony uh one of, of the many hats that you wear <clears throat> what would you say is the greatest challenge that you face as a program director balancing wants and needs I would love to give the residents everything they want. It's never going to happen. <clears throat> I've worked very hard to give them everything they need and more than a few of the wants. But sometimes people want more than we can give, you know, because there's still outside forces that require our training be such. There are, four, there are things that I require my residents to have in training that we cannot skimp on because they represent me. They're my work product, so to speak. And... 99 times out of 100, the residents are great. If I am willing to give them a, a good reason why we could, should, or should not do something, they're usually pretty darn good about it. Um, I remember once they asked me about it had to do with call and whether or not to come in and, you know, all this. And I almost responded with, this is when I first took over the program, I almost responded with, well, my day, you know, we used to do 36 hour calls and that's the best way to learn, but you want to know something? That isn't a response. That is not an argument for again or against it. That's not a rational argument. So what I, I stopped myself and I said to them, here's the reason why it's important to come in. An attending can take a call from home because on top of me being here, I've got 30 years behind me that I've spent in clinical practice. So I do have, I am well aware of my patients. I know them very well. I've reviewed them before I went home. And when I'm at home and the nurse calls me with information, I know these nurses long enough and I've known them long enough that I can respect what they tell me and what they don't say, what they don't tell me. And my clinical expertise is much greater than somebody who is a book smart but not clinical, has not been in it long enough. And believe me, a medical student, you know, a third and fourth year medical student, then an internship, or now it's a PGY one year transitional, whatever you want to call it, is not, doesn't replace 30 years of being on the floors and treating patients. So it's important that you get in here and you see the patient. And I said, and most importantly, that's somebody's mother, brother, sister, uncle, father, cousin. If you needed a phone call, 
from the doctor taking care of your loved one. Wouldn't you want that loved one? Wouldn't you, I mean, sorry, wouldn't you want that doctor to have actually seen your loved one? To actually lay, slap a pair of eyes on him and, and say, okay, this is a, I saw your father. He's doing well. He's a little sick. We're going to say, the point is, this is family. This is, this is somebody's family. So therefore, they're under our care and we're responsible. I found that, I went off on a tangent, I know, but I found that that argument was far more persuasive than, well, you know, we used to do 36 hour calls. You got it easy. You know, look how easy you got it. Well, I suck sometimes. It's tough. It's still a lot of hours. There's still a lot of your social life is gone when you're a resident. All your friends are out there, you know, who, who went to business school. They're all out there making buku bucks and you're, you're making a significantly amount less, a significant amount less and working more hours. Mm -hmm. So I felt showing them the respect of at least arguing. That's probably one of the hardest challenges to not fall back on while in my day. It can be pretty tough to sort of have to balance a few different things. And then of course, last question. Um, I, I was very fortunate enough to do an audition rotation at Mercy Hospital. It was a phenomenal month, learned a ton. Uh, any last bit of advice that you'd give for students um, who are about to embark on an audition rotation or maybe students um, who will be doing it next year or the following year? Uh, if you can get an audition rotation, that is probably the best way. But the key is, if you get an audition rotation, you're sure as heck better read, show up early, don't leave the second your shift is over, you know, show that you want to be there. And it's okay. One of, the, one of the big things that's happened, one of the biggest turnoffs for residents, I tell, I, I even said it to you, Tony, don't worry about your, your interview with me. Because if you had an audition rotation, I'm going to talk to the residents to see if they liked you. My opinion doesn't matter. Their opinion matters in this case because they worked with you on the floors and they liked you, by the way. There's no accounting for taste, but they liked you. Uh, I'm being facetious. Um, we had a medical student that would contradict the attending and the resident in front of the patient. Well, why don't you do this? Maybe we should have that discuss now, discussion outside of earshot of the patient so we don't confuse the patient saying, why is that doctor over there having a totally different opinion than you too? Well, one of the reasons is he's not a doctor. <laughs> he's a student physician. He should learn to keep his mouth shut at the right time. It doesn't mean you have to keep your mouth shut at all times. Any good educator is going to say, ask me why we chose this course. Mm -hmm. ask, ask me why that wouldn't be a good course, but don't do it in front of the patients. You don't want to muddy waters for the patient because it's tough to understand what's going on, even if you have a medical background. But when you're a patient laying there and you're scared and then people start throwing out things back and forth, it gets very confusing. Um, so definitely don't contradict the attending and the resident in front of the patient. Like, I think we should do it this way. It's nice. Nobody asked what you were thinking, though. So. We didn't even know you were allowed to think at your point in training. Are, are you? I'm being facetious. But um, it's kind of hard to screw up if you, if you have an inquisitive mind, you're willing to work, you're willing to come in early and say, listen, what can I do? Can I take an H&P for you? Can I do something? Don't just say, can I help? Mm -hmm. Look and listen and say, Oh, you guys have a lot of H and P's. Do you mind if I take a history and then you see how I did and I'll do it for you? And that's the point. Not just can I help? It's can I help you do this? And that's the best way to get in there. Doug uh, Jen, I, I can't thank you enough for the time that you spent. Uh, Happy to. It's a pleasure. Pleasure dealing with you too. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, thank you so much for allowing us to. Uh, reach out to you and uh, do this podcast. You're very welcome. And thank you for having me. Look forward to talking to you soon, Tony. Absolutely.